Uh, I'm Michal Zabrecki and I'm pleased to be with you here today on the occasion of a lecture uh, within the program of Bratislavske Hanusovetni. And I'm also very pleased to have a chance to introduce to you our today guest speaker, it is Dr. William Carroll. And now I'd like to provide you with a brief information about Dr. Carroll. Uh, Dr. Carroll is a Thomas Aquinas Fellow in Theology and Science at Breakfast Hall in Oxford and a member of the Faculty of Theology of the University of Oxford. He's European intellectual historian and historian of science whose research concerns the reception of Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian science in medieval Islam, Judaism and Christianity and the development of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. His research also concerns the encounter between Galileo and the Inquisition, which will be the topic of tonight's lecture. And finally, he's also just a fascinating person, and we are all in the treat for today to hear this lecture. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. William Carroll. Galileo, 
kneeling before the cardinals of the Holy Roman and Universal Inquisition into heretical depravity. That the, was the full title of the Inquisition. Holy Roman and Universal Inquisition into heretical depravity. By the way, it's now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. There are few images of the modern world more powerful than that of uh, Galileo being forced to admit before the cardinals and inquisitors in Rome, being forced to admit that the earth did not move. It is an image of blind faith, biblical liberalism, superstition, and authoritarian arrogance on the part of the Inquisition, acting to suppress science and the search for truth. This image occupies a prominent place in the modern world's understanding of the relationship between religion and science. And this evening when I talk about the legend of the Galileo affair, I'm going to be talking about that image and the source of the image and the accuracy of the image. More than 400 years ago, in 1609, Galileo perfected the telescope and made his, <coughs> his initial observations of the satellites of Jupiter, mountains on the moon, and of innumerable stars in the Milky Way. Galileo reported these discoveries in the Sidonius Uncis, the Starry Messenger, published in March 1610. <coughs> our view of the universe and of our place in it was forever changed as a result of the disclosure of the new celestial phenomena. The account of the new heavens, which Galileo described, was accompanied very quickly, <coughs> was accompanied very quickly by discussions of their apparent implications for science, for philosophy, and for theology. Perhaps most famous in this regard is Galileo's encounter with the Inquisition. That encounter continues to fascinate contemporary culture. In speaking before the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1992, Pope John Paul II noted that the theologians of the Inquisition who condemned Galileo failed to distinguish properly between particular interpretations of the Bible and questions which in fact pertain to scientific investigation. John Paul observed that one of the unfortunate consequences of the condemnation of Galileo was that it had been used to reinforce the myth of an incompatibility between faith and science. But that such a myth was still alive and well was immediately apparent in the way the press described the events in the Vatican in October 1992. The headline on the front page of the New York Times was representative. <clears throat> Quote, after 350 years, Vatican says Galileo was right. The earth moves. As though it was a new discovery for the Vatican in 1992 that the earth moved. Often in discussions about the Catholic Church's attitude toward science, or about claims concerning fundamental changes in church teachings. The story of Galileo serves as evidence for the view that the church has been hostile to science and that the church once taught which it, that which it now denies, namely that the earth does not move. The church taught that the earth does not move in the 17th century and now uh, the church teaches just the opposite, that the earth does move. So, so common story would have it. <clears throat> in current debates about cloning or human embryonic stem cell research, or the teaching of evolution, or questions about global warming, often proponents of such research compare opposition to it to the Inquisition's treatment of Galileo to oppose research in cloning or our human embryonic stem cell research is to oppose science and who's doing the opposing? The Catholic Church, just as the Catholic Church opposed the science of Galileo. 
So if you're in favor of human cloning, you're on the side of Galileo. If you're opposed to human cloning, you're going to do research involved with it. You're on the side of the Inquisition, and we all know we don't want, we want not to be on the side of the Inquisition. In the face of the persistence of the legend of Galileo's encounter with the Inquisition, it is important, it is important to remember some salient features of the Galileo affair, which may help us respond to the ideological use of the legend of Galileo. I don't wish to provide a detailed narrative of what happened in the early 17th century, but I do want to highlight some of the events of that early part of the century, events which can help us to avoid the erroneous understandings of the Galileo affair, erroneous understandings which are constitutive of what I would call the myth of Galileo's encounter uh, with the Inquisition, the legend of that encounter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened uh, in this early 17th century, and then <clears throat> the points I'm going to talk about uh, with respect to the events of the 17th century are particularly important with respect to debunking some of the uh, legend and some of its continuing power. Well, Galileo's telescopic observations disclosed that the heavens were not incorruptible bodies composed of matter fundamentally different from that found on the earth, as was generally called in traditional geocentric cosmology. His observations served him well in his defense of a moving earth. He thought, for example, that the moons revolving around Jupiter showed that there could be centers of revolution in the universe other than just the Earth. You see, one of the uh, arguments against Copernican astronomy, one of the arguments against heliocentric astronomy, was that while well, Copernicus were right, the sun is the center of the revolutions of all planets, including the Earth, and the Earth was the center of the revolution of the moon. Such a conception of the universe seemed to many absurd because it claimed two distinct centers of revolution. Galileo's observations of the satellites of Jupiter revolving around Jupiter now show for sure that there were at least two centers of revolution of heavenly bodies, the Earth, around which the moon revolved, and Jupiter, around which its four moons revolved. And this observation was of, the, of Jupiter as a center of revolution was particularly important for Galileo. And he used it to defend the view that the Earth moved about the sun. However, when we speak of Galileo's defense of the Earth's motion, we must be especially careful to distinguish between arguments in favor of a position and arguments which prove a position to be true. Galileo did not prove that the Earth moves about the sun. In fact, Galileo and the Inquisition accepted the prevailing ideal of scientific demonstration, which required that science be sure and certain knowledge in terms of necessary causes, not the conclusions of hypothetical or probabilistic reasoning, which today we tend to accept as science. Today, we might be critical of such confidence that science can reach the truth of things. But in order to understand the Galileo affair, we need to recognize what Galileo thought science was. And he thought science was sure and certain knowledge about what that which was absolutely true. Galileo himself did not think that his observations provided sufficient evidence to prove that the Earth moves. He hoped eventually to argue conclusively from the fact of ocean tides 
to the double motion of the Earth as the only possible cause. But in this endeavor, he did not succeed. Furthermore, even though some features of traditional geocentric astronomy could no longer be accepted, for example, Galileo showed that Venus revolved around the sun, there still was the astronomical system of Tycho Brahe, which was compatible with the new telescopic discoveries. Brahe, a Danish astronomer, had proposed that all the planets revolve about the sun, which itself revolved about a stationary Earth. Thus, to reject the geocentric astronomy of Ptolemy and Aristotle did not require that one accept Copernicus's heliocentric system. There was at least one other alternative, that of Tycho Brahe. It is certainly not the case that Galileo proved that the Earth was moving and that to oppose his conclusions, one had to be blind to science or committed to a literalistic interpretation of the Bible. One crucial part, of, one of the more naive parts of the legend of the Galileo affair is that Galileo proved that the Earth moved and the opponents suppressed that scientific truth. Galileo himself did not think that he proved that the Earth moved. Cardinal Roberto Bellamino, Jesuit theologian and member of the Inquisition, told Galileo in 1615 that if there were a true demonstration for the motion of the earth, then the church would have to abandon its traditional reading of those passages in the Bible which appeared to be contrary. But in the absence of such a demonstration for the motion of the earth, and in the midst of the controversies of the Protestant Reformation, the Cardinal urged prudence. Treat Copernican astronomy simply as a hypothetical model which accounts for the observed phenomena. But it was not church doctrine that the earth did not move. If the cardinal had thought <clears throat> that the immobility of the earth was a matter of faith, the cardinal could not argue, as he did, that it might be possible to demonstrate that the earth does move. Because if the cardinal thought it were a matter of faith that the earth didn't move, he could not admit the possibility of a demonstration to the contrary, because then the truth of science would be seen in contradiction with the truth of faith a violation of the first principle of Catholic teaching. Now, I've provided on your handout the principal parts of this famous letter from Cardinal Bellarmino in 1615. The occasion for writing the letter was a pamphlet sent to him by a priest from Naples, Paolo Foscarini, who had argued that there is no contradiction between the Bible and the New Assembly. <coughs> Bellarmino in this letter responds to Foscarini and includes Galileo in his response. In the first paragraph, and you have this on your handout, in, in, in the first paragraph, the, the Cardinal tells them, quote, first it appears to me that you, this is Paolo Foscarini, that you uh, uh, and the Signore Galileo are proceeding prudently by limiting yourselves to speaking hypothetically and not absolutely, as I've always believed Copernicus did. The Cardinal urges them to avoid making the claim that the new astronomy is in fact true. And then continuing, the Cardinal says, but to wish to affirm that the sun is really fixed in the center of the heavens and merely turns upon itself without traveling from east to west, and that the earth revolves very swiftly around the sun, is a very dangerous thing. Also, hold something to close, likely not only to irritate all the scholastic theologians and philosophers, but also to harm our holy faith by rendering holy scripture false. I've already referred
referred to what the cardinal wrote in the beginning of the third paragraph, but it's worthwhile quoting him directly. In this third paragraph, he says, if there were a true demonstration that the sun is in the center of the universe and that the sun does not circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun, then one would have to proceed with great care in explaining the scriptures that appear contrary and say rather that we do not understand them, the Bible, then that, that what is demonstrated is false. We don't deny the truth of science. But, he continues, I will not believe that there is such a demonstration for the motion of the earth huh, until it is shown to me. In the Cardinal's comments, and we take Cardinal Bellarmino here as paradigmatic because he is the leading Catholic theologian of the day. He is the key member of the Inquisition. He was for many years professor of controversial theology at the Jesuit Gregorian University in Rome. And one of his tasks there was to read all Protestant theological treatises and refute them. And so by looking at Cardinal Bellamino, we have a way into the minds, at least into the best minds of those of the Inquisition. Now, as I've already suggested, the question of a scientific demonstration for the motion of the Earth is one of the key elements to understand the Galileo affair. Indeed, you might ask yourselves, what would constitute such a demonstration? I often ask my students at Oxford whether or not the Earth is moving. And if they think it is, how do they know this? Or what kind of arguments could they advance for the claim that, in fact, the Earth is moving? Something we take as obviously true. Well, on what basis can we make those arguments? As a way, we need to see that although we accept that Galileo is right and the Inquisition wrong, it's not so easy to see what a scientific argument for the motion of the Earth might be, especially in the early 17th century. But anyway, my point here is that we have to keep in mind throughout our discussion that the issue of a scientific demonstration for the motion of the Earth is one of the key elements of the Galileo affair, and that both Galileo and the theologians of the Inquisition were concerned with the acquisition of such a demonstration. Now, an important feature of the widely accepted story of Galileo and the Inquisition is that Galileo's understanding of the relationship between science and scripture anticipates the modern view that the Bible is essentially a religious text and ought to play no role in disputes about the natural world. We tend to think today that the Bible is just that. You, you do not go to the Bible to get scientific information. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about science. It's purely a religious text. And this is an enlightened, modern view of the Bible. And part of the legend of the Galileo affair is that Gal this, this conception of the Bible as a religious text is distinct from questions of science. It's somehow uh, the view which Galileo was setting forth in the 17th century, and it is uh, an anticipation of the modern view. Right? We might recall in this regard Galileo's reference to the words of Cardinal Baronius of the 16th century, who wrote famously, quote, the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. In various places in Galileo's famous letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, written in 1615, in order to encourage the officers of the Inquisition not to condemn the current astronomy. In this famous letter, Galileo argues that in disputes about natural phenomena, one ought not to begin with typical passages. Uh, nevertheless, in other passages, Galileo does suggest that there are scientific proofs in the Bible 
and that wise interpreters, starting from scientific knowledge, can discover the true meanings of these biblical passages. Now, I'm not going to read this quotation for you, but uh, number two on your handout is a characteristic passage from the letter to the Grand Duchess Christina uh, for evidence for what Galileo thinks is a proper relationship between science and the Bible. But I think that when we read Galileo's writings on this subject, science and scripture, we can see that Galileo does not really anticipate some modern distinction between the religious character of the Bible and the claims of science. Rather, Galileo embraces ancient traditions of Catholic theology and also affirms principles of biblical exegesis characteristic of counter-reformation Catholicism. My point here is that contrary to the legend of Galileo, Galileo does not represent a so-called modern attitude towards the Bible as only being a religious text with no reference to scientific matters. So here now we've already had two features of my argument about the legend. One feature of the legend, Galileo proves the earth moves and he's attacked by the Inquisition because it's allegedly contradicts scripture. We talked about already what, he, what the Galileo thinks that we must have a scientific demonstration of the climate. Then he knows for sure that the earth moves and he does not have such a demonstration. And now a second feature of the legend of the Galileo affair that Galileo has a modern, enlightened view of the relationship between uh, the Bible and science. And my claim would be that, <coughs> that Galileo represents traditional Catholic understanding of that relationship. And I can talk more about this uh, in our discussion. Well, in early 1616, the theological experts of the Inquisition were asked to comment upon the critic of astronomy. In their report to the Cardinals of the Inquisition, they observed, this is quotation number three, and this is a, a report of a committee of experts given to the Cardinals who run the Inquisition. And they say, the proposition that the sun is immobile and at the center of the universe, feature of the American astronomy, that the sun is immobile and at the center of the universe is foolish and absurd in philosophy, and formally heretical, since it explicitly contradicts in many places the sense of Holy Scripture according to the literal meaning of the words and according to the common interpretation and understanding of the Holy Fathers and the doctors of theology. As a result of this judgment by experts, this is section, text number four in your hand, as a result of this judgment, Galileo, 1616, was ordered to abandon his commitment to the new astronomy. Books which appeared to be compatible, which, which argued for the compatibility of Copernicus and scripture, such books were prohibited from being published, and Copernicus's own book, on The Revolution of the Heavenly Spheres, Copernicus's own book was to be corrected so that passages referring to the Earth's motion would be presented only as hypotheses. The theologians of the Inquisition and Galileo adhere to the ancient Catholic principle that since God is the author of all truth, the truths of science and the truths of revelation cannot contradict one another. In 1616, when the Inquisition ordered Galileo not to hold or to defend the Perdican astronomy, there was no demonstration for the motion of the Earth. Galileo expected that there would be such a demonstration. The theologians of the Inquisition did not expect that there would be such a demonstration. It seemed obvious to the theologians in Rome that the earth did not move. And since the Bible does not contradict the truths of faith, the theologians concluded that 
given certain passages in Scripture, such as the book of Joshua's story of the sons standing still, the Bible should be read as affirming that the sun moves about a stationary earth. The analysis of these theologians proceeded from the erroneous presupposition that it was obviously true scientifically that the Earth was immobile and at the center of the universe, and therefore the Bible should be read consistent with what was obviously true scientifically. The Earth did not move. So the Inquisition did not think that it was requiring Galileo to choose between faith and science, nor in the absence of scientific knowledge for the motion of the earth, would Galileo have thought that he was asked to make a choice. Here again, it's important to remember that Galileo and the Inquisition thought that science was absolutely certain knowledge guaranteed by rigorous demonstrations. Being convinced that the earth moves is different from knowing that the earth moves. Galileo was convinced that the earth moves, and he sought a demonstration to prove that the earth moves, so that he could say that he knew that the earth moved. The 1616 disciplinary decree of the Inquisition, Galileo, don't do these things, these books are not to be published, and so forth. The disciplinary decree of the Inquisition concerning what Galileo was to teach and what books were not to be published, that decree was certainly unwise and imprudent but the basis of the Inquisition's actions was a subordination of the interpretation of certain passages of the Bible to a geocentric cosmology, a cosmology which would eventually be rejected. Such an action by the Inquisition is just the opposite of the domination of science by religious faith third element of the legend of the Galileo affair. What the Inquisition did was to subordinate science, suppress science in the name of biblical truth. My point, what the, what the Inquisition did was just the opposite. However goofy it is what they did, the Inquisition thought it was obviously true scientifically that the Earth did not move. And because it was obviously true that the earth did not move, they read the Bible to say the same thing. So they subordinated the interpretation of the Bible to a particular geocentric cosmology, which they assumed was absolutely true. Rather than the common legend, which has the Inquisition trying to suppress science based upon the Bible. In 1632, Galileo published his dialogue concerning the two, two chief world systems, in which he did support the Copernican world system. As a result, it seemed clear that Galileo had disobeyed the 1616 injunction not to defend Copernican astronomy. So in 1633, the Inquisition, to ensure Galileo's obedience, required that he publicly and formally affirm that the Earth does not move. Galileo, however reluctantly, acquiesced, acquiesced in the Inquisition's demand. But from beginning to end, the actions of the Inquisition were disciplinary, not Doctrine. Don't do these things. Do these things. Disciplinary decrees, not doctrinal decrees. Although these actions were based on the erroneous notion 
that it was heretical to claim that the earth moves. Erroneous notions remain only notions. Opinions of theologians are not the same as Christian doctrine. Not in the 17th century, not in the 21st century. Disciplinary actions of the Inquisition, ordered by the Pope, in each case, as a matter of fact, remain disciplinary actions, not doctrinal pronouncements. So did the church teach that the earth did not move? To teach would be to proclaim a doctrinal position. However wrong the Inquisition was to discipline Galileo, we must remember that discipline is not doctrine. As I said, even when the discipline is ordered directly by the Pope, as it was in both 1616 and 1633. And now, in the discussion period, I think we can uh, flesh out a bit more this distinction between teaching through discipline and teaching through doctrine. An important modern source of the view that the Galileo Affair is a central chapter in a long history of warfare between science and religion. <clears throat> and that's an, a crucial feature of the legend of Galileo. It serves as convincing evidence for many that there has been and continues to be a kind of conflict, a warfare between science and religion. An important source of that view can be found in the debates in the late 19th century over the reception of Darwin's theory of evolution. It was and is easy to use the example of the so-called persecution of Galileo by the Inquisition as an ideological tool to attack the religious opponents of evolution. Since it was obvious by the 19th, late 19th century that Galileo was right, it was useful to see him as the great champion of science against the forces of dogmatic religion. The supporters of evolution were seen as modern-day Galileos. The opponents of evolution were seen as modern-day inquisitors. Now, you remember that Darwin's Origin of Species, published in 1859, huh? opponents of the Declaration of Papal Infallibility, formally adopted at the First Vatican Council in 1870, used the Galileo Affair to show what they considered to be the absurdity of such a declaration of papal infallibility. Had not at least Two popes solemnly proclaim that the earth does not move so much for our papal infallibility. Also, in the also at the same time in the 19th century, we have Italian unification, the Risorgimento, over against the papal monarchy, papal states which had been reduced more and more. Garibaldi, Mazzini, and others embraced Galileo as a political hero. He becomes an Italian scientist in the 19th century, not a Tuscan scientist. And just as the reactionary Catholic Church suppresses or suppressed the emergence of reason and science in the case of Galileo, so that same reactionary Catholic Church is opposing modern political liberalism, Italian nationalism, and Italian unification. So Galileo becomes a hero for the Risorgimento. And since we all know Galileo is right and the church wrong, so we know that Garibaldi and Mazzini and Italian nationalists are right and the papal monarchy wrong. One book which continues to exert inordinate influence in the interpretation of Galileo, as well as the broader question of the relationship between science and religion, was written by Andrew Dixon White more than 115 years ago. He is the founding president of the Cornell University in the United States. And that book is a history of the warfare between science and theology in Christendom. 
White describes the Galileo affair in terms which, despite their rhetorical excess, ought to be familiar. And this is quotation seven on your handout. And as you pay attention to the wonderful verbs, English verbs you see here, evidently gives you white. Galileo's discoveries had clearly taken the Copernican theory out of the list of hypotheses and placed it before the world as a truth. Uh, you see that part of it. Against him then, the war was long and bitter. The whole struggle to crush Galileo and to save him would be amusing, were it not fraught with evil. There were intrigues and counter-intrigues, plots and counter-plots, lying and spying, and in the thickest of this seething, squabbling, screaming mass of priests, bishops, archbishops, and cardinals appear two popes, Paul V and Urban VIII. It is most suggestive to see in the crisis of the church, at the tomb of the prince of the apostles, on the eve of the greatest errors in church policy the world has known, in all the issues, the deliberations of these consecrated leaders of the church, no more evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit than in the caucus of New York politicians. The ways in which the legend of Galileo had been used for various ideological purposes seem to defy the imagination. I've already referred to debates on evolution, cloning, stem cell research, and so forth in the contemporary world. But I might finally here as an evidence to cite an especially bizarre example from the 20th century. And it is a bizarre example, as you will see. In May 1938, Adolf Hitler paid a state visit to Italy to strengthen the Rome-Berlin axis. At an official ceremony in the Palazzo Venezia, Hitler handed Mussolini a document expressing, quote, the gratitude of the German people towards one of the most famous scientists in world history. Hitler continued, quote, as Führer and Chancellor of the Deutsches Reich, I request Benito Mussolini, the Duce of the people, that has given the, the great inventor and scientist Galileo Galilei to the world to accept as a token of our reverence and friendship a Zeiss telescope and the complete equipment of an observatory. The gift of the telescope honors Galileo and his fight, quote, for the theory of that great German Nicholas Copernicus. Now, for some time, even before Hitler's ascent to power, many Germans considered Copernicus to be German, not Polish, since he was born in Torun, which was in German born, which had been founded by the Teutonic Order of Knights in 1231, ceded to Poland in 1466, to Prussia in 1815, and back to Poland in 1919. But it was a common view, even among Germans, German intellectuals, that Copernicus was German. And Kepler, like Copernicus, also German. And thus the origin of modern origins of modern science are what? German and Italian. These three scientists, Kepler says, Kepler, Copernicus, and Galileo collectively serve as a symbol for the German-Italian axis which Goebbels, Hitler's minister for propaganda, conceived, quote, as the centerpiece of Occidental culture. As Galileo and Kepler were intellectual brothers in arms, so too are Mussolini and Hitler. Mussolini represented Galileo, Hitler represented Kepler. As Goebbels observed, Brothers in arms spoke for a better and more unified Europe. There is yet a further twist to this bizarre story. In March 1937, Pope Pius XI issued an encyclical, which among other things condemned Nazi, Nazi racial theory, the superiority of Kyrie Rex, condemned. 
A German mathematician, Ludwig Feuerbach, known for his commitment to Deutsche Mathematik, that somehow mathematics has a German dimension to it, a racial theory of mathematics, he published a book in 1938 on Galileo and the Inquisition. The author, Peter Bach, compared the trial of Galileo in 1633 with the show trials in Moscow ordered by Stalin, comparing the Catholic Church, of course, to Stalin. Yes. At the heart of this book, however, Biberbach offers a rejection of the Pope's condemnation of Nazi racial theories. In the heart of this book about Galileo and the Inquisition comes an argument against Pope Pius XI's criticism of Nazi racial theories. Biberbach. Just as the reactionary Catholic Church at the time of Galileo wrongly sought to support the advance of science, so too in the 20th century that same reactionary Catholic Church wrongly condemns the new science espoused by Nazi Germany. The Galileo affair became thus an ideological tool to support Nazi policy. The lesson Biberbach drew was clear. To oppose Nazi racial laws was like opposing Galileo's claim that the earth moves. A bizarre use of the legend of the Galileo. The persistence of the legend of Galileo and the image of warfare between science and religion, even in our own day, is the result of the many ideological uses the legend serves. Current controversy within the Catholic Church, for example, concerning what kind of authority Rome has or should exercise on a range of topics is instructive in this regard. Writing in the British Catholic Weekly, the tablet, in March 2004, and this is the quotation taped on your handout, Michael Hoskin of Cambridge University reflected on what he called the real legend of Galileo. He claimed that, quote, the much heralded rehabilitation of Galileo in 1992 by Pope John Paul II was in part an attempt to gloss over the falsity of the doctrinal decrees issued with papal endorsement by the church organizations of Galileo's day. Hoskin continues, if the Holy Office was mistaken in the doctrinal decree then, its successor, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, could be wrong now. But this, he says, is not a conclusion the Church has allowed. Note how important it is for Hoskin that what happened in the 17th century be recognized as an error in doctrine versus what I called an error in discipline. According to Hoskin, and continuing now in the quotation, the real issue of the Galileo affair for the church today, an acceptance of the possible reformability of doctrinal pronouncements promulgated by the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, even with the approval of the public, has yet to be learned. We should not accept as final doctrinal pronouncements issued by the congregation of the doctrine of the faith, even when those proclamations are approved by the Pope. So here we see the use of the legend of Galileo in a debate within the Catholic Church about what kind of authority Rome properly has, even on doctrinal matters. Well, finally, there is no evidence that when Galileo in 1633 acceded to the Inquisition's demand that he formally renounce the view that the earth moves, that he muttered under his breath and forcing all of that, but still moves. What continues to move, despite evidence to the contrary, is the legend that Galileo represents reason and science in conflict with faith and religion. Galileo and the Inquisition shared common first principles about the nature of scientific truth and the complementarity between science and religion. In the absence of scientific knowledge that the earth moves 
and with the and with the firm but misguided assurance that the earth did not move, the Inquisition required Galileo to affirm that the earth did not move. However unwise it was to insist on such a requirement, the Inquisition did not ask Galileo to choose between science and faith. Doctor, thank you very much.
respect to science, that modern science comes about by uh, being free from the clutches of religious domination, huh? so that most people have some understanding of something called the Galileo Affair. And that understanding is often uh, part of what I call the legend of the Galileo Affair. So my lecture directly challenges a common cultural, a common feature of contemporary culture. Therefore, it perhaps, when first heard, my interpretation might sound strange. Okay, so what do you do when you hear strange interpretations, or what appear to be strange interpretations? If you are interested in pursuing it further, well, you can pursue it further. There are many, many, many books on the Galileo Affair. Now, I will make a kind of uh, claim of an expert, since this is one of my fields of specialty. My expert claim would be that in general, the views I've presented about what happened in, with Galileo and the Inquisition, that's shared by most contemporary historians of science. Most contemporary historians of science would agree uh, with me concerning the debate about scientific demonstration and what Galileo thought science, uh, 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 science in Rome. But even though we historians of science know better what happened in the Galileo affair, the legend remains powerful in our culture. It remains powerful because it is particularly useful in any number of contemporary ideological debates. Should we engage in cloning or not? It, no. So in all and so many contemporary cultural debates, it's particularly useful to employ what I call the legend of Galileo as a kind of ideological tool to attack your opponents. And therefore, the legend remains strong, not because we don't know better, because historians of science do know better, but the legend remains strong be precisely because it is used ideologically. It's used ideologically. I mean, uh, but to your primary point, all I can tell you is that uh, I'm a professor. My job is to profess something. To profess something means to make some arguments. And your judgment ought to be, did I make arguments? What are those arguments? Do the arguments make sense? Finally, whether the arguments are true, well, that would require more than just whether or not they made sense. So uh, my task tonight was to, in some respects, to whet your appetites, find out more about the Galileo Affair, so forth, and, by, and, and I tried to do that by being moderately provocative, because my interpretation of the Galileo affair does run counter to a common cultural view that there's warfare between science and religion, and the case of Galileo is evidence for that. And I think both claims are false. But if you want to know more, there's more to know, for sure. Okay. Could I ask this you about uh, the myth about Galileo and Giordano Bruno and also the, uh, the planet is Earth? The, is Earth is flat? Uh, could you tell me more? The myth wasn't about the Earth being flat. Yes, but uh, it is... It, there is another myth in history that somehow uh, at the time of Christopher Columbus, most people believed the Earth was flat, and courageous Christopher Columbus decided to set off, sail into the West to prove that it was flat, to prove that the Earth was flat. Do you think the king and queen of Spain would have given any money at all to Columbus if they thought the Earth was flat? That would be a crazy waste of money. I don't think it is, but uh, there's a theory from the end of the 9th century that uh, the conflict about science and church, and uh, do that means belongs also Galileo, also Jordan Bruno, also uh, this. Uh, could you tell me more about the evolution of the ideas or 
models of the space from the ancient to medieval. Well, I could tell you what, I teach history of medieval science, yes, but that would be a long story. You know, <laughs> so, in the ancient world and in the Middle Ages, all the principal scholars, almost without exception, all knew for sure that the Earth was a sphere. Right? The notion that the Earth was flat uh, began in, 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 in for medieval and ancient thinkers is a development in late 19th century scholarship about Christopher Columbus, part of the hagiography in the United States, making it to a center of Christopher Columbus, was advancing the view that he was so courageous in the face of the view that everyone thought the earth was flat. No one, I know, none of the major thinkers in the Middle Ages, or in ancient Greece, thought that the Earth was anything other than right, than, than, than a sphere. Giordano was surely burned at the stake. In fact, it's one of my favorite places in Rome. Not because Giordano Bruno was burned there, but because I like the Campo de Fiore. Huh? But Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for lots of reasons. Not, not among them. Were, his, were views about the motion uh, of the Earth, but rather uh, conceptions that there is no fundamental difference between Protestantism and Catholicism, and a lot of other, uh, a whole variety of uh, heterodox views in philosophy and theology. But many people think, put together too quickly the stories of, uh, of, of uh, the burnings of the state of Giordano Bruno and the attitude towards uh, uh, towards Galileo, but they really are sort of diverse reasons for the treatment of, of Bruno and for the treatment of uh, Galileo. But if that covers the whole of your question, you want to go on? There is also known that uh, some of the students uh, said that uh, the Earth third is uh, of the shape uh, of the Shiloh Cardo or something so. Augustine? Yes, I read it somewhere. But the person, the early Christian thinker who is best known for thinking the earth is flat is a fellow by the name of Lactantius, not St. Augustine, not St. Augustine, Lactantius is the name. And uh, <laughs> there are similar views about the Dark Ages and so forth that somehow it's only at the time of the Renaissance and the scientific revolution that we have uh, reason and science and philosophy developing, and that's all a false caricature of the, of the Middle Ages, too. Great era. I mean, after all, the Middle Ages in, uh, uh, are the period in which the great universities are found. I don't know where I've answered all your questions. Tom, I have a question. I was very interested with the relationship between Galileo and the Inquisition. And you were saying something that there is a difference between teaching or error of doctrine or teaching or error of uh, discipline. Correct. And you were saying that it was not a conflict of uh, this, uh, doctrine, but a conflict of discipline. But, you know, for me, I, I, you know, I, I would ask you to, to more expand on this, you know, this distinction because you might say that as Inquisition, I say that Galileo was not offending the doctrine of Catholic Church, but was offending the restriction of the Holy See, you know, saying some conflicting uh, statements about doctrine. So this distinction is not that clear to me. Okay, so that's, that's a good question. I encourage people to think about this, because this would be an area in which some historians would disagree with me. Because they would think that the distinction 